At the outset of World War I in the August of 1914, Europe and the Middle East were in the midst of redefining their age-old ideal of imperialism, as well as developing the new ideal of nationalism. Racial and cultural tensions were high, and many believed that perhaps peace had run its course. It was a time ripe for war. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke and heir of the Austrian-Hungary throne, by Serbian insurgents, was the final straw in a long line of hostilities between the two countries. It was also the event that gave Germany its excuse to back Austria-Hungary and join the war. The line was quickly drawn between the so-called Central Powers and the Allied Powers, and within months, the war to end all wars was on in full, with the world as its stage. The idea of chemical warfare was not entirely new, but it had never before been used, declaimed instead as an uncivilized manner in which to conduct war. During World War I, however, this idea changed. The French were the first to develop the rudimentary form of tear gas in 1914. By 1915, Germany had taken their formula, enhanced it, and then deployed the newly developed chemical agent with devastating effect at the Second Battle of Ypres in Belgium. With this new innovation of war, a new method of protection was invented along with it, the gas mask. Its two key components were a dust filter to keep out any solid contaminants and an activated charcoal filter that worked to absorb most harmful gases. The mask fit snugly across the wearer's face, making it uncomfortable and unwieldy as it limited the wearer's vision. The major disadvantage of airborne nerve agents was the fact that they could easily be blown back onto the side deploying them if the winds were variant. This made it necessary for attackers as well as defenders to don their gas masks to avoid contamination, thus hindering both sides. Because of this and other problems, nerve agents fell into disuse after the war, giving way to even deadlier forms of chemical warfare where a gas mask, or even clothes, would be little protection. It has long been a common practice for soldiers to craft items during wartime. The term trench art was coined by a French publication during World War I as a way to identify the variety of objects made during the time period. The trench half of the title comes from the long trenches that soldiers often bunkered down in during the war. Despite its rather provocative title, trench art was not normally crafted on the front lines, unless the soldiers were working on a small piece that did not require large tools. Larger pieces were usually made by soldiers at rest in the main camp, invalid soldiers, civilian artists, or POWs. The most popular and perhaps common form of trench art known today is that which was made from artillery shells. But the art was not limited to this medium. Wood, bone, and cloth were also used depending on what materials and time the artist had at his disposal. Pieces range from intricately designed shells depicting battle scenes from the war to small matchbox covers with perhaps a company name or national symbol etched onto its surface. Other pieces included embroidered swatches of cloth, wooden picture frames, cigarette holders, rings, vases, letter openers, and painted helmets. There was no real limit to the style of trench art, and because it was made by such a wide variety of people, including commercial businesses after the war seeking to make a profit from tourism to the battle sites, it is difficult to classify the art beyond its moniker of trench art. But no matter what it is called or what it may look like, the art created during World War I stands as a portrayal of the men who fought and died in the world's first great war.